I'm very happy to be here to share our perspective on quantum computing in the automotive industry. And I would like to talk about three things. First of all, I will give you an overview about what is our quantum strategy and why are we engaging with quantum computing. Second, I will talk a bit about our applications and the importance of benchmarking and that we clearly see here. And I will conclude you know, with, with some reflections on the current state of quantum computing. So why do we care about quantum computing? Um, currently, we operate a high-performance computing infrastructure comprising more than 400,000 compute cores. And this is the growth trajectory there. So basically, one would hope, hey, more slower, everything will get faster and we need less compute. But the opposite is true, right? With every uh, new generation of high-performance computing system, the demands for computing will increase, right? First of all, we typically we open up new simulations and application domains. Uh, for example, obviously we do crash simulations, we do aerodynamics, computer fluid dynamics simulations, but nowadays also for our manufacturing sites, we do a lot of simulations, for example, for forming and other methods being used in the plant. And our business got more complex, right? We are on the transition to e-mobility, meaning we also have to worry about you know, electric engines, drivetrains, batteries, and all this kind of stuff. And then we have this big wild card that is driving the computational demands, which is AI, right? And Obviously, you know, a lot of focus is on you know, what does it take to run large language models and do inference on those models. Uh, but we also will use AI, for example, in the context of computer simulations. And I will also give you a specific example later in this presentation. So how can we handle those demands? Right? Uh, in the past, uh, we are, I'm sure the term Moore's Law was mentioned several times in, in this conference. We have been using CPUs. We are currently on the transition of introducing GPUs, both for high-performance computing, but also, of course, for AI, with AI being the primary driver of this trend. And hopefully, right, we can maybe soon plug a QPU into our high-performance computing systems in order to accelerate you know, very specific types uh, of applications or application kernels. And I will talk about which one those are in a bit. Another important link, or I would like to highlight, is you know, that progress in AI and in computing in general is driven by computational capabilities. Right? There's Sutton Spitter lesson, and he says, hey, forget about those handcrafted domain-specific models. And by the way, a lot of the models we are currently doing in those near-term quantum area are feel somewhere like that. But you somehow have to build scalable systems that can basically convert compute into intelligence, right? And uh, clearly, you know, hopefully quantum computing can make a contribution there to give us a new type of compute to build even more intelligent systems than they, we can build right now. So what applications domain are we looking at? Nothing too surprising. Obviously, artificial intelligence, optimization, right? I mean, every manufacturing company has manifold optimization problems from supply chain, manufacturing, to sales, after sales, pricing, just to name a few. AI, I mean, we are co-located here with the AI Summit. Clearly, the vision there is, you know, every text box on the internet will have an AI um, plugged into it. Also, every text box and every enterprise application will do so. Uh, so clearly, that's one of our drivers. The second one. Material science, I already mentioned, right? We are on the transition towards electric mobility, meaning chemistry matters even more now, right? We have to understand chemical reactions going on into the, in the battery, but we are also investing into fuel cells vehicles, and that's equally important. Last, simulations, I already gave you a glimpse of what's going on on our high-performance computing systems. There's also some you know, theoretical proofs right, that linear systems of equations can be accelerated using quantum computing. There are also some challenges I will touch on later on. And post-quantum security, I'm part of the BMW Group IT. Keeping the system secure is like you know, one of our key tasks and missions there, and we also have an eye on that. I will not talk about that in detail in that talk. 
So where do we see quantum computing right now? Scott Aronson just put out a beautiful blog po post he titled Quantum Computing Between Hope and Hype, right? So and I guess you know, many in the community kind of feel uh, in a similar superposition, right? On the one side, we have you know, this exciting things are going on. We talked about error corrections here in the panel. We saw the progress on Continuum. We saw the progress on Google side with respect to error corrections. So there are many, many exciting things going on. At the same time, right, if you are an application users and try to use the hardware that's available via the common channels in the cloud, uh, you will find out, right, that um, there is currently no quantum impact on your business and you need to stay put. On the algorithm side, um, that's basically what I am alluding to is, right, if you run a near-term quantum algorithm, very likely you have to run it on a very simplified version of your problem and you will not see a business impact. At the same time, you, you see so many innovations also happening on the algorithm side of things. Shor's, Shor's algorithm just got improved last year, and that's a very recent result. Basically, you need now much fewer gates than you used to use to take uh, before. We also see exciting new near-term algorithms. For example, people using uh, GPT, so generative pre-trained transformers, AI models, and quantum models in together, right? Basically trying to feed you know, some quantum correlations or some insights you know, from the quantum side into the classical AI side. So I think we are definitely not done uh, with the near-term quantum algorithms. And maybe there is something to uh, get out of those near-term machines. Finally, ecosystem. Yes, I mean, there's a drop in private investments in quantum computing, but at the same time, uh, the government is stepping in, not only in Germany, but also globally. So now, unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about you know, all our quantum projects, but I cherry-picked you know, some highlights, and I linked you know, all the publications that are associated with that on that slide. And let's start with the optimization domain. And we really try to have a very balanced portfolio where we're looking at near-term NIST algorithms. We're increasingly starting to look also into fault tolerant algorithms, but also into quantum-inspired or even classical solutions, right? Once we went out to solve, for example, our robot path problem that we have everywhere in our plant, right? It's great that we invested so much time into modeling it. Why not use it, uh, solve it classically and actually deliver a business impact? And that's uh, important. So uh, capacity planning, I bought a little a movie here, right? So typically you have those kind of distribution problems. You have uh, manufacturing networks with component plants, with full plants, and you at some point need to decide you know, in what plant you want to produce a part, taking into account logistics costs, uh, what does it cost to operate a machine at this point in time, terrorists and all this kind of stuff. And uh, needless to say, there are uh, plenty of optimization opportunities there. I want to highlight you know, one specific uh, algorithm that uh, one of our PhD students invented, which is Quero, Quantum Informed uh, Recursive Optimization. It's basically a variant of RQ&A, and that's like the beauty, you know, how can you combine classical and quantum optimization and really go hand in hand to find an optimal solution uh, by, co uh, by kind of co-developing the classical and the quantum part of the solution. Second, uh, material science. Um, this is out of a publication um, together with Continuum and Airbus, uh, where we have been uh, developing a variation quantum icon solver to investigate materials for the fuel cell. Uh, platinum, for example, is heavily used in fuel cells. It's one of the most expensive materials in that fuel cell. And the question is, might there be a compound, a platinum compound that is more affordable? Third. Synthetic data generation, and this is work that we have been doing uh, together with the, or within the Quantum Technology and Application Consortium, uh, QTech, because obviously that's also a very, um, a thing everyone needs, right? We want to have synthetic data in order to train our AI, and we want to maybe utilize the quantum benefit there. Um, yeah, so also, you know, quite some exciting papers on there. And last but not least, I'm always getting back to the high performance computing side of things. Uh, I mentioned before for computer fluid dynamic simulations, the picture here is actually the cooling of an electric engine. So this is some real stuff, um, not generated with quantum computer. I put it on there, just not to be sure, right? No one puts it in the wrong context. And 
Uh, so there are many promising approaches of actually solving those kind of you know, differential equations in that context, HHL being one of those algorithms. I mean, there are some minor problems. You need to get the data in, or in that case, you need to get the data out of the quantum computer. Uh, so we're investigating both tensor network approaches, but we're also investigating something which is called differential quantum circuits, which is basically a, a parameterized quantum circuit similar to a physics-informed neural network. So many you know, exciting stuff, exciting place on, on, on the team. So um, let me, I would like to talk a bit about benchmarking. Obviously, benchmarking you cannot say, right, there are no benchmarks in quantum computing. There are benchmarks all over the place. We talk about quantum volumes, we talk about clubs, we talk about you know, many things in the quantum community, which is great. And typically those metrics are also some somehow a proxy for what it actually means to an automotive application or an industrial application, but not really, right? Uh, what does it mean to have a quantum volume of 1,000? And that's why we started to investigate heavily into benchmarking. What we also figured out, it's challenging to design good benchmarks and also to develop the, t the tooling for the workflows for those benchmarks. And that's actually something uh, we are investigating in an open source project, which is also available at GitHub. Um, so it's basically a tool that allows you to create and iterate on application level benchmarks and share them with the community in a reproducible way uh, with awesome documentation. Currently, that tool focuses on two problem domains, which is optimization and machine learning, but it would be also amenable to chemistry or material science problems. So, and I think I have a QR, or I had the QR code on the previous slides. Just want to highlight, I mean, we have been engaged in that Quark project for uh, quite some time. We started in 2021 with that project. We now have more than five different application kernels with really BMW data in there. So if you go to the Quark GitHub repository, you find, for example, a set problem, so an optimization problems for our configurations. Uh, you will find a QML problem, and you find a robot path problem. Now we just, this year, we added two interesting, exciting new problems. Uh, one is, how to load a truck. I, I know it sounds boring on the first sight, but if you get into the details on how many cars you can put on a truck or a freight train, uh, taking into account the weights and the length of the cars and what the truck is actually able to carry. So a very exciting problem, and we have the data now on Quark as well. And we also have a contribution from Capgemini, um, the maximum independent set problem that's also now available in Quark which is a very useful problem, for example, if you plan your retail uh, network. And we also uh, added new device support in there, for example, you can now also use noisy devices and uh, create some awesome data with Quark. So that already brings me to the end of my presentation. As always, right, progress in quantum computing firsthand depends on the hardware, right? But obviously, we would like to guide hardware development because in the early phase of quantum computing, it's not just you know, hardware and algorithm co-design. Co it's actually also figuring out what type of problems and what type of applications uh, go hand in hand. So it's actually hardware, algorithms, and applications co-design. And uh, I think it's exciting to see the progress. It's less exciting to experience the limitations. Uh, but I think uh, we are just uh, getting started there. Benchmarks are instrumental, and I also would highlight you to a recent paper on uh, that we just put on archive, so it's not peer-reviewed yet, uh, but if you want to have a look, it gives you an overview about uh, all applications there. And with that, thank you very much for your time.